President, we just had a vote here in this chamber on uh, a very significant piece of legislation. It was the motion to proceed to it. It was uh, passed with good Republican and Democrat majorities, both sides of the aisle, supporting moving to this debate. And because we have co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle, uh, I feel confident that we'll get to an endpoint, and we must, because this issue of trafficking human beings is something that the Senate must stand up for, particularly because there's a federal law that now permits trafficking online that otherwise would be considered a criminal act. So I want to talk a little about that legislation tonight. Uh, we probably won't have the final vote, I'm told, until Wednesday. And some of the information I'll provide tonight um, will be setting the reasons, the, the basis for doing this legislation. And then between now and Wednesday, we'll have the opportunity more about the specifics of it, what's happening online, and how the United States Senate can step in and provide the legislation to remediate what is an obvious problem to anybody who looks at this issue. Human trafficking is such an egregious crime. We all, I hope, agree with that. It's also a very lucrative crime. $150 billion a year is the estimate. That's probably second only to the drug trade in terms of the amount of money involved. And think about this. This is selling human beings. The U.S. Senate has taken steps in this body in a bipartisan way over the past six or seven years to focus on this issue, and I certainly commend my colleagues for that. Senator Richard Blumenthal, a, a Democrat, and I, as a Republican, started a bipartisan caucus uh, to stop human trafficking about six years ago. And we started with two of us, and now there are a couple dozen. There, there are many members who are engaged and involved in this. Over those past six years, the Senate has passed legislation to increase the penalties on those who buy children for sex. So for the first time in a decade and a half, we increased the federal penalties. We have helped to stop international trafficking by U.S. government contractors overseas with legislation that was signed into law. We've, we've helped with regard to finding missing children by requiring for the first time that those missing children have a photograph attached to them. Unbelievably, until that legislation, most kids in my home state of Ohio and other states who go missing do not have the information provided to law enforcement and others, uh, people who work in shelters, people who are in the juvenile justice system to be able to find those children. Why is that so important? Because as you can imagine, kids who go missing are sometimes the most vulnerable to being trafficked. We've also passed legislation to improve the data on trafficking. Uh, there's legislation that's called the Sex Trafficking Data and Response Act, which we passed in this body to provide better information about this problem so we can come up with better solutions by understanding what's going on. It, it's in the shadows. You know, it's, 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 as I said, very profitable, but an illicit activity. So that legislation was critical. Uh, by the way, the primary author of that legislation was Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. And Senator Wyden will be on this floor probably over the next couple of days talking about some of the concerns he has about the online legislation we have, but I want you to know that Senator Wyden has been out front on opposing trafficking through this uh, Sex Trafficking Data and Response Act. By the way, I was the lead Republican on that legislation, so I worked with him and I commend him for that. Uh, we've also passed legislation to change the paradigm in federal law from treating these children who are trafficked as victims rather than as criminals. The key is to get these young people into treatment, longer-term recovery, deal with what is, as you can imagine, a very traumatic situation, often related to drugs as well, so drug treatment. And it is something that I think is perhaps the most important thing that we can do is to understand that these are victims who, in order to get back on their feet, need to be taken from the criminal justice system and put into the kind of treatment that they need. Despite efforts here in the Senate, and by others around the country, by the way, to deal with this trafficking issue, and, and I think a raising of awareness about it. Unbelievably, today, as we stand here, in this country, <laughs> we see an increase in one type of trafficking, and that's in sex trafficking. And, and you might ask, how could that be possible? You know, we've passed all this legislation to help. We've got increased consciousness about the issue. People are more aware of the problem, and, and certainly, there is a consensus that this is something we ought to crack down on, and yet it's happening. And I will tell you what the experts say. They say it's happening for one simple reason. 
And that is because more and more women and children are being sold online. The ruthless efficiency of the internet. So that's where this legislation focuses. And it focuses there because that's where we see the problem. Traffickers are using the internet to sell women and children. And we have a responsibility to act. And if we don't act, we'll allow a federal law that was passed by this body 21 years ago, and I think inadvertently has created part of the problem by shielding these websites. So I'll talk more about this uh, later in the week as we get into the specifics of our legislation and why it would address the problem. But the bottom line is, we've got a real problem. The anti-trafficking group Polaris recently received its 2017 report. The report illustrates the true nature of the crisis. This is the heat chart put up by Polaris. It shows the locations of cases reported to the National Human Trafficking Hotline last year alone in 2017. As you can see, and this explains why you see such a strong bipartisan support for our legislation, this is happening everywhere, every state in the union. And unfortunately, it's increasing, not decreasing, despite all of the efforts locally and even here at the federal level. The national hotline that Polaris runs, and I hope to be at that hotline, by the way, later this week, as they're opening a new facility and expanding what they're doing, but they experienced a 13% increase in reported cases nationwide just last year. So despite all the efforts, they're seeing actually an increase. In my home state of Ohio alone, 371 cases of human trafficking reported to the hotlines across the country. Their hotlines handled a record 8,759 cases in 2017, up from 7,737 cases in 2016. Again, these are only the cases that are reported. That doesn't mean that there aren't many, many more cases out there that are not reported to the hotline. In the 10 years that they've operated these hotlines, by the way, human trafficking reports have increased 842%. Again, unbelievable what's happening in this country in this century and increasing. I chair a group called the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. A couple of years ago, being interested in this issue, we started to talk to some of the experts around the country. Uh, I was meeting with people back home, particularly the victims of trafficking and some of the survivors, and I kept hearing the same thing from everybody, whether it was the advocacy groups uh, for those being trafficked, whether it was law enforcement, um, whether it was the social service agencies helping to treat these women and girls, particularly dealing with this trauma we talked about earlier. And that one thing we kept hearing was the word back page. That's just one website. But it seemed like there were a lot of people being trafficked on that one website. I certainly was hearing it back home where these women and girls were saying to me, Rob, this has moved from the street corner to the smartphone and back page is where I was trafficked. Turns out nearly 75% of all child trafficking reports the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children receives from the public involved back page. 75% of the reports. Another anti-trafficking organization called Shared Hope International says service providers working with child sex trafficking victims have reported that more than 80% of their clients were bought and sold on Backpage. So we talked earlier about how lucrative this business is, but one website seems to have practically monopolized this. With that knowledge, in 2015, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations uh, led by ranking member Claire McCaskill from Missouri and myself, conducted an investigation. We spent 18 months researching this. We looked at every angle of this issue, and specifically, we looked into how Backpage operates. It wasn't easy, because Backpage was not willing to cooperate, as you can imagine. What we did find is the company was far more complicit in these crimes than we had previously thought. We subpoenaed Backpage for their company documents. They refused to comply. And when you refuse to apply, uh, uh, comply with a subpoena around here, normally you can kind of tell people, well, if you don't comply, you know, we'll bring the full weight of the criminal law down on you. They still wouldn't comply. So we had to come to the United States Senate, the floor of the Senate, to enforce the subpoenas. It hasn't been done in 21 years around here. Fortunately, when we made our case to our colleagues here in the Senate, everyone in the Senate said, yes, uh, let's be sure that they do comply by taking this to the criminal justice system, allowing our lawyers here to take this case. So we did. 
And we thought, well, we'll win a case in the district court level, which we did, and that'll be it. No, they appealed that. We won a case in the circuit court level. We thought that was it. No, they appealed this. Are you getting the drift here? <laughs> they did not want to supply these documents. They did not want to testify. Finally, we took it all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court agreed with us and told them that they had to comply with the threat of criminal sanctions if they did not. So having won that, we then found ourselves in possession of over one million pages of documents. In other words, they flooded us with documents. And our lawyers did a good job going through it. And through this investigation, we found what some of us had kind of thought might be the case, which is that this company was actually complicit. In other words, they knew what they were doing. They were knowingly facilitating criminal sex trafficking of vulnerable women and children. They actually coached traffickers on how to edit the adult classified ads to post so-called clean ads for these illegal transactions. And then, of course, they cover up evidence of those crimes in order to increase their own profits. In 20, 2006, as an example, Backpage executives instructed staff to edit the text of adult ads, not to take them down, mind you, but to edit them, which is exactly how they facilitated this type of trafficking. By October 2010, Backpage executives had a formal process in place, we learned through all these documents, of both manual and automated deletion of incriminating words and phrases in ads. This is an email from one of Backpage executives in 2010. It says, quote, I'm attaching a spreadsheet with the most current list of coded items to be stripped out. Email me your list by the end of the day. Thanks. In other words, they were telling these people who were posting ads, oh, you can't say this word or that word because then law enforcement will know that we're engaged in selling underage girls online. And so they told them to edit these words out. It's unbelievable. What kind of words were stripped out of the ads, um, allowing sex trafficking posts to stay up without violating those proposed rules? These are the kind of words they took out. Teenage, little girl, a schoolgirl, um, cheerleader was one of them. Uh, for those of you who are literary types, Lolita, which was a, a novel about an underage girl and an older man. Uh, fresh. So, Amber Alert. Uh, this is the kind of people we're dealing with here. Once these incriminating words were removed, the posts could then go on the website, and that's how Backpage coached the traffickers on how to get away with their crimes. Again, this filter didn't stop the ads, uh, even though they knew it was illegal activity. They only edited them to try to hide that, so it didn't change what was advertised. The, the fact that these were underage girls, uh, they only edited it the way that it was advertised. And of course, this did nothing to stop the criminal activity. It facilitated it knowingly. The incentive, you know, why would Backpage go through all this? Well, quite simply, profits. I mean, this is a very profitable enterprise. So what is the cost of these crimes? Very profitable, but the cost is human dignity, trauma, the cost is far more than money. It's suffering and sometimes human life. I've heard stories of this. I know my colleagues in the Senate have heard stories about it, and that's why there's so much support for this legislation across the country. These individual stories are compelling. They're powerful. They're heartbreaking. Imagine for a moment that your daughter is missing. She's been gone for several weeks. She's 14 years old. And someone says, you ought to look on this website called Backpage. And so you do. You look on Backpage, you're a mom, and you find your daughter. This is the story of Kabiki Pride, an MA. She told her story bravely before our permanent subcommittee investigations. She told us the details. We were able to use that as part of our investigation to be able to come up with a response, a legislative response. But she said she actually told Backpage. She called them and said, I found my daughter. She's been missing for weeks. She's on your website. Thank you for taking down the ad and helping me to connect with my daughter. As you can imagine, these were sexually explicit photographs of a 14-year-old girl. She didn't know she was alive or dead, so she was excited to find her, but appalled by what she saw, as any of us would be. What did Backpage say? 
We can't take down the ad because you didn't pay for it, did you? Of course I didn't pay for it, she said. It's my daughter. That's the level of evil we're talking about here. This is another story and another brave individual who's come forward. This is Nicole, the mom, and J.S. Nicole also bravely testified in front of the Permit Subcommittee on Investigations. J.S. was a 15-year-old. She ran away. She loved her family. She wrote him actually a five-page letter saying how much she loved them, but she chose to leave the safety of her family and home, and she ended up in a homeless shelter for teens. A 22-year-old woman posing as a teen there, by the way, approached her and said, uh, I can help you make some money. Introduced her to a pimp who then sold her on Backpage. For more than three months, she was sold online multiple times a day. Finally, an undercover police officer posing as a customer rescued her. And thankfully, he did, because for so many other girls, the story goes on and sometimes ends in a very tragic way. This is Yvonne Ambrose. Yvonne actually testified before the Commerce Committee and did a beautiful job as a mom talking about her heartbreak and her tragic encounter with Backpage. Yvonne got a call on Christmas Eve 2016 that every parent dreads. And it was about her daughter, Desiree. And the call said that her 16-year-old daughter had been murdered after being exploited and sold for sex on Backpage.com. So one of the Backpage customers apparently was the one who murdered her beautiful daughter. Yvonne is holding Desiree's memory. Kubicki and Nicole are fighting for justice by working with us to try to hold these websites accountable. These are only three examples tonight, but there are so many others, so many that I have experienced back home, and again, heartbreaking stories. Uh, one girl told me she started to be trafficked at age nine by her father. Uh, others have told me of not having parents at home and being in foster homes and then leaving the foster homes either when they're emancipated at age 18 or earlier and the horrible situation they found themselves in. I've had the opportunity to meet with survivors in the cities around Ohio, in Dayton at Oasis House, uh, in Columbus at Alvis, in Akron, Toledo, Cincinnati, and Cleveland. The majority of these young women, the majority tell me the same thing, back page. Usually drugs are involved as well to create the dependency. Unbelievably, for years, these websites have gotten away with this. Because when the parents like Yvonne or Kabicki or Nicole file a lawsuit for damages to try to stop what's going on, they're told, we're immune. When the prosecutors in these local communities step up and say, how could this illegal activity be going on? This is illegal to do on the street corner. Certainly it's illegal to do online. The judges say, we're immune. So again, we'll get into this later as to why that happens, how it happens, and what we are doing about it in this legislation. I look forward to that discussion. I look forward to the debate here in the Senate floor as to how we came up with a very targeted, very specific approach to this that doesn't interfere with the freedom of the internet at all, but it does stop activity that never was imagined, that when Congress passed a law 21 years ago was never imagined that it would permit this kind of criminal activity online. Tonight, I want to thank those families who've had the courage to step forward, tell their stories publicly, channel their grief into something constructive, which is to come up with a legislative solution that helps to address this problem so that the next 14-year-old daughter, 16-year-old daughter, does not find herself in these same horrible situations with all of the trauma and all of the heartbreak that occurs. Justice cannot be seen, but its absence can be felt. 
And that's what's happening now, an absence of justice. Those who have been trafficked online only see the websites that knowingly facilitated it prosper and escape legal consequences. That has to stop. To me, that's an injustice. So I look forward to further debate again this week. I look forward to the vote on Wednesday. If we can pass the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, we will make a difference. We will save lives. We will save women and girls and boys from going through this traumatic experience and enable them instead to achieve their God-given potential in life. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back.